morning and you are all very welcome, very welcome indeed to our morning service here at St Altman's, uh, whether you're here in the building with us or whether you're joining us online and it's good to gather together whether uh, virtually or in person, gather once more as part of God's family uh, as the Lord's people this morning uh, to worship him together and may we uh, encourage and strengthen one another as we meet together this morning. A couple of verses from uh, Psalm 19 as we begin. Verses 7 and 8 of Psalm 19 remind us that the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. And let's rejoice as we sing our two opening songs this morning. We begin uh, with May the Peoples Praise You. Let's uh, stand to sing together.
please do uh, sit down. Well, we've just sung there, haven't we? What boundless love, what fathomless grace you have shown us, O God of compassion. And it's in uh, God's love and grace and compassion that we can come before the Lord now uh, to acknowledge and confess our sins and seek his forgiveness, uh, which we do as we say the words of our confession. Let's say it together. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you through our own fault, in thought and word and deed, and in what we have left undone. We are heartily sorry and repent of all our sins. For your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. And we pray. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Good morning. morning. It's looking rather grand, isn't it? We've got notices, bands, and an interview. Thank you, James. That's very kind. Thank you for trying. Good. Anyway, uh, notices first of all. Uh, let me uh, say a few things to you. Uh, don't forget, Easter is coming up. That means a couple of things. Uh, it means, uh, on a practical note, it's a good time of year to sign up for our electoral roll uh, if you haven't done already. This is not one of those years where everybody needs to sign up. If you're already on the electoral roll, then you will stay on the electoral roll. That's no problem. But if you are a regular here and you haven't yet uh, signed up on the electoral roll, I would encourage you to do that. It is one of the ways that we kind of uh, take account of who consider themselves to be a member here. It's not a terribly complicated form. Uh, you, there is one box to tick, and if you're, uh, if you're uh, unsure of which box to tick, I can help you uh, with that. So please do talk to me at the end. There's forms available at the back. Do grab me at the end uh, if you're interested in coming on the electoral roll, and I would encourage you uh, to do that. Uh, whilst you're gathering at the back looking at the electoral roll forms, you might also wish uh, to look at the flower rota. There are some spaces available uh, on the flower rota if anybody is interested uh, in participating in that. Um, if you are unsure about what that entails, oh, it's obviously something to do with flowers, uh, but if you're unsure with exactly what that entails, then please do speak to Anne, who's going to give us a wave, Anne. Thank you, Anne. Uh, do speak to Anne after the service if you're interested in helping with that. Uh, and finally on Easter, uh, the, uh, the Easter services that are coming up are advertised in the uh, news sheet. Don't forget, next Sunday is Palm Sunday. That is an opportunity to invite folks to that if you know anyone who would like to come and think about what Palm Sunday is all about. And then obviously we've got the services Tuesday, Thursday and Friday in Holy Week and then Easter Sunday, uh, which is also the day when the clocks go forward. So be aware of that. Be aware of that little fact uh, on, uh, on Easter Sunday on the 31st of March. I think that is sufficient uh, by way of of notices. Now, I cannot see the band's book anywhere, but I can probably remember your names. You're Peter, <laughs> aren't you? You're Adam Peter, aren't you? Have you got a middle name? Either? Miss Christina. Okay, let me write that again. It's, just, it's very professional, this, isn't it? I'll find the book later, but I'll publish the names now. So let me publish uh, Bands of Marriage between Adam Peter Heaton and Aoife Christina O'Dowd. This is for the second time of asking. Uh, if you, any of you know any reason why this couple uh, may not lawfully be married, uh, you are to declare it to me. And I was very mean to him last week. Because you're here, uh, I'll be nice. Good. I will find and sign the book a little bit later on. And finally, interview. Thank you, James. Oh, you're there. She's gone. You have the microphone, I don't tend to need one. Uh, so, uh, you have got uh, exciting news for us, haven't you? So do you want to tell us what it is? Yes, uh, well, I think some of you uh, have heard already. Well, first thing to say is, unless James is about to drop a bombshell, uh, we're not leaving. No, not <laughs> <laughs> uh, If I had a pound for everybody that's come up to me in recent weeks, oh, you're leaving. No, no, I'm not leaving. We are temporarily 
going elsewhere. As I think most of you know, I'm, I'm currently doing the Church of England's lay reader course to hopefully become a licensed lay reader. And as part of that, I've got to do a six-week placement at another church of a sort of different tradition and background to this one. So starting next Sunday, uh, and then for a further five Sundays after that, uh, I'll be going to Christchurch, uh, Belper. Um, that's where I should be doing my placement that I have to do uh, for my course. So we won't be around for a few Sundays. Um, so, so you're learning about uh, other expressions of Anglicanism? Yeah, basically it's to so that one can appreciate the sort of the breadth and the depth and the wide variety of uh, yes styles of Anglican churches and services and different types of worship, etc., etc. So, yeah, that's the, I think that's the general gist of it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so uh, we are in for a few minutes or two uh, uh, as you head off for that, through the rest of March and into April. And what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> I'm leaving, no. <laughs> uh, I am supporting my husband in his lay reader training. Uh, yesterday I made him breakfast because he was on a training day. <laughs> and, for the next... <laughs> and for the next six weeks I shall be going to Christchurch with him. Um, the children will be coming here, so it'd be nice. With Granny. With Granny, thank you Granny. Um, uh, mainly because uh, we don't want to um, have nobody going to Sunday Club. <laughs> Um, but also, we think it'd be good for them uh, to experience church without us. Um, but we will really miss you. I know it's only six weeks, but we really will miss you. Well, let me pray for those things. Heavenly yeah. Father, we do thank you for the call that you've given to James uh, into lay reading ministry. And we pray for him as he nears the end of his training, as uh, we look forward to what that's going to look like uh, in the coming weeks, months, and years. And we pray uh, that you be with James now. Pray that there will be a time when they can uh, learn something new about your church uh, and also something new about you. Be with them uh, in a strange place uh, and uh, in a different kind of church. Uh, pray uh, also for Tom and Nancy uh, that you be with them as they come to church with our mum and dad and uh, how strange that is. Uh, and we pray that you be with Granny as well. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Another change, I think. <laughs> I'll get rid of us, there's far too many. Um, yes, so uh, I was looking through what we're studying today in Sparks, um, and it get, I, as I was looking through the story of what we were reading about, a few images came forward that would be important to learn, and I thought I might as well draw some of those images up for you at the front. You can see if you recognise some of the parts of our Bible story for today. And to do that, I've got an easel somewhere. I think it's over here. So I'm going to help move it for a minute. And then my lovely assistant, Adam, is going to come and help in a minute. So if you put your hands up, if you think you know one of the images I'm drawing, what it might be, because uh, I can't promise that my drawing will be up to your standards, um, then Adam will come around with the mic and we'll uh, let you speak into it for us. Uh, and I will see how, uh, how well I'm feeling like I can draw this morning. So, our first one, that's me. Lovely. Let's start off with something really easy for you. You're all good. You're all knowledgeable. Let's start with something simple. I think maybe that, maybe, maybe a sort of that. Yeah, that looks, that looks all right. Maybe, maybe something like that. And then... That. There we go. Maybe just to make sure you all understand it's nice and black. There we go. Has anybody got any guesses as to what this first image is? Any guesses? We've got a hand over here. Let's see if we can guess. A crown. Yes, it is a crow plus N. Crown, you're doing well already. <laughs> Lovely. Now, I can't promise all these are going to be as clever as that one because I couldn't think of any for the rest of them. Um, so, we'll see how the rest of these go. So we've got a crown. Does anybody think they can guess what the story might be about today? Any ideas? Any ideas? Oh? David becoming king. David becoming king, maybe. Let's see. Let's see if the rest of these help us out. So here's our second one. 
maybe even for like a line down here, something a bit like this, and maybe like a bit like that, and then the pens, you know, maybe something like that, and then and on and on and on. Maybe I think it's something like that. There we go, that's better. And maybe sort of a that looking thing. Yeah, he needs his little poofy hat, doesn't he? There we go. Uh, yeah, something like that. Lovely. What's this? <laughs> Who can tell me what this is? Any guesses? We've got a couple of hands uh, over here. We've got Lucy. Who can bath. Tell me? Is it a bath? It is a bathtub. Yes, absolutely. Well done. So we've got a crow plus N and we've got a bathtub. So we're going to see if these next ones are going to help you out. Let's go over to our third drawing. Now we're really pushing my artistic uh, ability, so we'll see how this goes. Um, something like um, <laughs> this, I think. I think it's sort of like this. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I'm getting some people who seem to be giving me positive not acknowledgement. They don't look like that. You're a liar. Did they? Okay. <laughs> Maybe some like jewelry bit, bits at the bottom. There we go. It's very ornate. Right. Anyone guessing what this one is? A harp. A harp. It is a harp. Well done. So we've had crow plus n. We've had a bathtub. We've had a harp. And there's one final image in our story this week. And we'll wonder if any of you can think about who it might be. So here's our last one. Uh, let's just fill that bit in. And maybe some. Just a bit of a rainy cloud with a weird dot on the front. There we go. Maybe a bit more like that. There we go. Any guesses what that one is? Is it a sheep? <laughs> it is a sheep. Well done. It's the best I can do. <laughs> I'm under a time pressure, people. I don't have time to prep these. Lovely. Now, if you've got in your mind a idea of what story might link all four of these pictures, the sheep, the heart, and the bathtub. There we go. And finally, our crow plus n. If the thing isn't falling over, there we go. Crow plus n. Then you'll just have to ask your children about it this week <laughs> after Sparks as we look into exactly what links, what story links all four of these images. So I implore you, please do ask your children about it after Sparks. I'm sure they'd love to tell you more about the character who links these together. But before we send them off in prayer, it's good for us to unite in the praising of God. So we're going to stand to sing our children's slot for this week. It's a light and a hammer. There will be actions up the front, or at least my best attempt at them. Please do stand and join in.
always good fun to have a song that tries to catch me out when I can't remember what the action is for light. So that's good fun. Lovely. Um, before our young people head off into the hall and into the, uh, into the vestry bit as well, I'm going to pray for us. Let's bow our heads in prayer and let's pray for our young people. Lord God, we thank you for the blessing that it is for all of our children and young people who come ready, eager to receive and listen to your word. I pray, Lord, for those young children uh, and those young people that come today with questions, that they come seeking answers, and that, Lord, I pray for our leaders as they uh, read us through the Bible and read us through these different activities that will hopefully help reveal more and more about your character, Lord, to us. And for those of us, our church family, who get to stay in the service, Lord, I pray that we encourage and we challenge those young people when they do come back as well to join us in the hall as well. Lord, I pray that we continue to grow and push each other closer to you in our conversations after the service, just as much as we do from listening to your words spoken to us at the front. Amen. Lovely. Let's get going. Our first reading this morning is Psalm 86. You can find this on page 592 in the Pew Bibles or 547 in the Large Print Bibles. Incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Preserve my life, for I am godly. Save your servant who trusts in you. You are my God. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for to you do I cry all the day. Gladden the soul of your servant, for to you, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call upon you. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer. Listen to my plea for grace. In the day of my trouble I call upon you, for you answer me. There is none like you among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. The nations you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. I give thanks to you, O Lord my God, with my whole heart and I will glorify your name forever. For great is your steadfast love towards me. You have delivered my soul from the depths of Sheol. O God, insolent men have risen up against me. A band of ruthless men seek my life, and they do not set you before them. But you, O Lord, are a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Turn to me and be gracious to me. Give your strength to your servant and save the son of your maidservant. Show me a sign of your favour that those who hate me may see and be put to shame. Because you, Lord, have helped me and comforted me. This is the word of the Lord. <coughs> Just before we come to prayer, I just want to share. Um, 16 years ago, newly married, James and I did the rounds to find a church together. We were uh, sent with Mark's blessing, who said, don't look for what there is, look for what you can do. And we tried several. One Sunday lunchtime, we were due to go somewhere else in the evening, and I turned to James and said, I want to go home. Fortunately, James realised that I didn't mean hibernate in my pyjamas. So we turned up, 6.20, walked into the hall to our church family who welcomed us and since then have walked with us, taught us 
stood with us through many joys. One of them's in there, and one of them's in there. And many, many sorrows. And for that, I want to say a heartfelt thank you to each and every one of you. Let's pray. Psalm 43 says, Vindicate me, O God, and defend my cause against an ungodly people. From the deceitful and unjust man, deliver me. For you are the God in whom I take refuge. Why have you rejected me? Why do I go about mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? Heavenly Father, we live in a world that is broken, but we know that you don't close your eyes to the sin and wickedness that happens. We ask that we would be vigilant in reading your word and seeking your will so that we wouldn't be drawn into the deceit of others or the temporary, dissatisfactory pleasures of this world. Bring to our minds when we see this world as it is that we can find refuge in the safety of your wings, our loving Father, who made a beautiful world and will one day welcome us into a world where everything is correct, fair, and beyond our wildest dreams. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. Then I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy, and I will praise you with the lyre, O God, my God. Lord Jesus, thank you that in every situation, in every day, we can have joy despite outside influences. Because we can know that we are held by a loving God who is true and real. Therefore, we can celebrate and praise, praise you with hope and with full hearts because we are known and loved. We ask for help to encourage one another through doubts, through missteps and stumbles. Keep in our hearts and minds that we have an able, mighty God who is worthy of our praise and help us want to share this good news with those whom we meet, however we meet them. And we pray for this same passion and joy to be filling our mission partners, Dan and Vicky, Ted and Rachel, Graham and Becky, in their areas and fields of mission. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. Loving God, we confess that sometimes we listen to ourselves or others before we come to you in our times of distress. When we are downcast, please turn us to you, the only one who can give us true hope. And we remember those we know who are in need of your comfort, healing, hope and peace in a moment of silence. Lord, everyone we've brought to you is known to you. I pray that you would ease their suffering, quieten their doubts, and comfort them in their sorrow or distress. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever.
Our second reading this morning is taken from the Gospel of John, chapter 10, and we're starting at verse 22. It can be found on page 1081 in the Pew Bibles and 993 in the large print Bibles. <clears throat> John chapter 10, starting at verse 22. At that time, the Feast of Dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. So the Jews gathered round him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me, but you do not believe because you are not part of my flock. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? The Jews answered him, It is not for a good work that we are going to stone you, but for blasph blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said you are gods? If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world, you are blaspheming, because I said, I am the Son of God? If I am not doing the works of my Father, then do not believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works, that you may know and understand that the Father is in me, and I am in the Father. Again, they sought to arrest him but he escaped from their hands. He went away again across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing at first, and there he remained, and many came to him. And they said, John did no sign, but everything that John said about this man was true, and many believed in him there. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, many thanks, uh, Jody and Emma and Mary, for uh, leading us in our readings and prayers this morning. And uh, could I invite you all now, please, if you're able, uh, to stand with me uh, as we're going to declare what we believe, declare our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. So let's say together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead, and the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And before James comes to bring God's word to us this morning, we're going to remain standing to sing again a song which reminds us that Jesus has saved us, and Jesus is always with us. For my life he bled and died, Christ will hold me fast. We sing, he will hold me fast.
Please you sit down. Now let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and pray that as we look at it together this morning, you'll speak to us from it. Give us our eyes to see and ears to truly hear from you. Amen. I suspect many of us here this morning uh, have had a conversation at some times uh, that's gone a little bit like this. You're talking to someone you know a little bit at work maybe or on a different occasion. Uh, maybe you're on the school room, whatever it is. Uh, uh, some club or society you belong to, and you've been talking about various things. And, and at some way in the conversation, uh, the fact that you go to church comes up. Maybe they asked you what you did at the weekend, and you have to mention uh, you were at church uh, over the weekend, or whatever else it is. Somehow or other, uh, the fact you came to church came up in the conversation. Uh, and so uh, the person who you're speaking to says, oh, so you're religious, are you? You're religious, are you? People said that to you? They said, oh, you're, you're, you're religious. Okay. Now, what do you say to that? What do you say to that? On one hand, of course, uh, the answer to that question is yes. Christianity is defined as a religion, a belief system. So yes, being a Christian makes me religious. But on the other hand, religion covers a whole host of things, doesn't it? In our day, being religious means that you believe in some kind of uh, belong to one of the major faiths, whether that's uh, Christianity or Judaism or Islam or Hinduism uh, or Sikhism or whatever. It usually means in most people's eyes that you're a little bit of a do-gooder as well. There's usually that sort of, oh, you're religious, are you? There's usually that element to it a bit, isn't there? Uh, because, well, because for most people, the two are connected. For most people, if God is out there and at all vaguely interested in things, then presumably what God's interested in is people doing the stuff that he tells them to do. And if God's interested in people doing the stuff he tells them to do, then presumably that means religious people are those who are making the effort to do the stuff that God tells them to do, and therefore they must, therefore, by definition, be some kind of, kind of do-gooder who think that they're making more effort than everybody else and perhaps presumably think that they're better than everyone else. Maybe uh, people think, now that you've told them that you're religious, they're re-evaluating what they've just told you. Uh, but uh, they're, re they're also re-evaluating you. They're thinking, well, okay, it's probably a little bit more boring than I thought. Um, and uh, maybe I won't invite him uh, to next, the next party I have. You know how it goes. Because religions get lumped together, don't they, and all treated roughly the same. We have religious education. Religious education is about comparing faiths and saying, well, you go to a church, uh, and I go to a mosque, or I go to a synagogue, and you have the cross, and we have the crescent, and all those kind of things. And so religions get lumped together as a hodgepodge of beliefs and idea that are basically about doing good things. I guess that's why... For many of us, when we're asked whether we're religious or not, we give at least a mental sigh and say, well, I kind of want to say, well, yes, but at the same time, no. Because I don't really want a religion to be lumped together in what the world out there thinks of as religion. I want to challenge that basic assumption that all religions are basically about doing enough good stuff that you'll get to heaven. I want to challenge the idea that every religion has a little bit of access to the truth, but perhaps not the whole truth, and that the true religion is that made-up religion of comparative religion where we take the best of everything and lump it all together. But how do I get around that conversation? Where do I start? What is it I begin with to sort of break that kind of assumption about the fact that I'm religious and therefore I just sort of fit with all those other slightly nutty religious people that somebody's met? Well, I think the answer to that is to talk about Jesus. To talk about who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. 
So this morning, as we come to John 10, as we come to John for the last time in this series, really, we get, we get, we're going to look at John over Easter, but we've been focusing on John 7 to 10 uh, since January, haven't we? As we return to John 10 together, let us just focus our attention there. What is it that Jesus Christ has come to do? Who is it that Jesus is? Because what's distinctive about Christianity is Jesus. Who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. And today I want us to think about this passage by looking at two realities about Jesus, responding to two realities about Jesus Two calls. Come with me then to verse 22 as we see first this. Come to Jesus the Christ who preserves his people and is one with the Father. Well, let's look at together at verse 22. We're on page 1081. If you're following it through in your Bibles, it's on the screen uh, as well. What does it say? Verse 22. At that time, the feast of dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter and Jesus was walking the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. So we're moving on through. If you remember, uh, the last few chapters of John have been based at a feast. It's been the Feast of Booths. Uh, That's a kind of uh, october time of year feast. It's a kind of harvest festival kind of thing. Uh, Once we get to the next festival, the Feast of Dedication or Hanukkah, well, that's a winter festival. That that happens uh, around about December time, okay? That's what we're talking about here, the Feast of Dedication. Uh, It is wintertime in Jerusalem. A few weeks have passed, but Jesus is still in Jerusalem. He's walking in the colonnade of Solomon. The colonnade of Solomon was one of the areas around and about the temple, uh, and presumably he's walking in the colonnade of Solomon because it's warmer and or drier uh, than uh, to be outside. I don't think we need to read any more than that into it. Uh, But there is something here about Jesus being in the vicinity of the temple. Given all that's been said already in John about who Jesus is, given what Jesus has said about himself, here is Jesus uh, walking in the temple area. Uh, And the Feast of Hanukkah, by the way, the Feast of Dedication, uh, is something that came about after the end of the Old Testament. In the mid-second century, there was a time when the the temple was desecrated by uh, uh, somebody called Antichius, Uh, Don't worry too much about him. The Feast of Hanukkah is the Feast of Rededication, uh, and it's one that was celebrated by the first century and is still uh, celebrated today. You've probably even heard of the name, Uh, and it's a Feast of Lights, and it's a feast that remembers uh, God's uh, people being rescued. Uh, It's a feast of of, of heroes. It's a feast of celebration of God's activity. So there is Jesus. He's in the temple for this feast. He's in Jerusalem. Jerusalem. And he is discovered, isn't he? Verse 24. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, how long will you keep it in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Now, the way the English is translated for that, it sounds uh, reasonably innocent. It sounds as if sort of a group of Jews have just come up to Jesus and said, oh, we've got some sort of gentle questions for you. Would you like to answer them? Not quite like that, really. Uh, That word for surrounding, uh, gathered around, is the word for surrounding, encircling. If you encircle someone, it's generally with a little bit more hostile intent, isn't it, than just sort of going up to them with a question. Of course, don't forget the rest of the context. There's been one or two discussions over the last few chapters between Jesus and the Jews, and I think it's fair to say that the Jewish leaders here, the Jews, have not been on Jesus' side. Is that a fair summary? of what we've heard over the last few weeks? Yeah, I mean, look, nod just so it looks like we've, we've all been listening, okay? Humor me. Yeah, it's not. This is an adversarial situation. There's a folk who a number of times have wanted to get rid of Jesus, and he's had to escape from their clutches. So there's a challenge in the question. How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Like, that is not so much, tell us that you are the Christ so that we might believe in you. That is more, let's, will you please finally implicate yourself so that we can do something about you? Which is partly why the answer comes in the way that it does in verse 25. Jesus answered them, I told you and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me, but you do not believe because you are not part of my flock. Here is the problem. Jesus says to them, you are asking me to show you, to tell you whether or not I am the Christ. 
I have done many works in front of you. Chapter 9, remember, uh, the, the, the healing of the man who was born blind. We can go all the way back through John and see miracle after miracle. And we know from the other Gospels that there were other miracles that John doesn't record. These works have been done by Jesus. They have been visible. They've not been hidden. We saw in chapter 9 with the whole stuff about the man born blind. In the end, no one could deny that the man was healed. They have borne witness about who Jesus is. Because the works and the words together show that Jesus is one who comes from God. But they don't want to see what's in front of their eyes. They won't see what's in front of their eyes. It's as if, at least in part, Jesus is saying to them, look, I could show you another thing, but why on earth would I expect you to believe that, given you've not believed any of the other things that I've shown you? They will not believe what's in front of their eyes. They cannot see because they're not part of Jesus' flock. See how these two things go together. Their unwillingness to see, their unwillingness to look, their unwillingness to see the truth, and the fact that they do not belong to Jesus' flock. Remember the language of flock from last time. Jesus, the good shepherd who knows his sheep. Again, verse 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Here are Jesus' sheep. Jesus' sheep are the ones who know him. They're the ones whom he knows, who he has brought to himself. The Pharisees in rejecting Jesus show themselves not to be part of that flock. Verse 28, I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. It's interesting, isn't it? Here we have this uh, question, this challenge uh, from the Jewish leaders, the Jews, uh, to Jesus saying, who are you are? Tell us who you are. Are you true the Christ? Jesus says to them, well, look, I've already told you that, so you should be able to know from what I've already shown you, but then goes on to sort of deliver this great encouragement to us, to the readers of John, to remind us that Jesus holds us fast, that he is the one who gives eternal life, that eternal life means we'll never perish, that Jesus holds us and no one can snatch us out of his hand, that his Father holds us and no one can snatch us out of the Father's hand. These are words of great insurance and encouragement, aren't they? That Jesus Christ is in control. He gives eternal life, and he holds his people fast. After all, verse 30, I and the Father and are one. Here we are assured of the united action of Jesus and God. Remember what the problem is here. The problem is that Jesus Christ is claiming to be God. Now, the issue with that for the Jewish leaders is that that suggests that there is God, God, who we know, God the Father, and then there is this other God, and the assumption is that they will be in opposition, or that because there's another God, the majesty of the first God isn't quite as great as it was. That whole idea that goes all the way through the Old Testament, the fact that God is one, seems to be threatened by the idea that Jesus Christ comes along. But Jesus has been very keen to show to us that actually the fact that he is God, that he is God's son, does not threaten God's sovereignty and majesty at all. Because he and the Father are one. Because he does the Father's will. Because he never acts apart from the Father. All these things that Jesus is telling us do not fear this truth about me, because I and the Father are one. God the Father, God the Son, act together. They have the same plans, they have the same purposes, they have the same will. They are united in what they do. It means, that means a number of things for us. It means that when Jesus comes uh, among us, he truly reveals God to us because he is God himself, God's son. It means that we can be assured and be confident in Jesus' promises. He will hold us fast. We are in God's hands. We are in God's hands. It is Jesus Christ who has done this for us. So as we look at this uh, first part of the passage. Let's draw encouragement from it. 
Jesus Christ is God's Son who has come among us. He and the Father are one. Here is the thing uh, about Christianity which is distinctive. That God himself came to earth for us. That he walked among us. That he calls people to himself. He is the one who preserves his people. Come to Jesus the Christ who preserves his people and is one with the Father. And then second, come to Jesus the Son of God who comes from the Father. Look at verse 31 with me. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? Why the stones? Well, from that claim in verse 30, I and the Father are one. Uh, this, as we'll see later on, is considered to be blasphemous. It is claiming to be equal with God. Uh, and yeah, completely understandably, if you're not equal with God, claiming to be equal with God is a problem. But notice Jesus' challenge in verse 32. What are you stoning me for? Because the issue is that they're not rightly seeing what Jesus Christ has done. They should not be accusing him of blasphemy given what they've seen. They should be recognizing that his words and his works taken together demonstrate that he is truly God's son. And therefore they should be responding to him with faith, not with rejection. Because he's shown them who he is. Verse 33, the Jews, an Jews answered him, It is not for a good work that we're going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you being a man, make yourself God. It is the identity issue, isn't it, at the end of chapter 8 that we saw. Uh, who is Jesus? Uh, there's irony in that language, isn't there? Because you being a man, make yourself God. That is not what's happened here. That is that Jesus Christ being God has made himself man. That's the wonder of the incarnation, isn't it? Not that a man becomes God, not that a man becomes godlike, not that someone is specially anointed to be a special kind of prophet, a special kind of teacher, a special kind of whatever. No, but that God comes down and makes himself man and becomes one with us, truly human. That's the wonder of the incarnation. Again, John's full of irony. Here is another one. Uh, it is not blasphemy, of course, because you, being God, make yourself man. Jesus answers them in what to us initially is a quite surprising way. Verse 34, it is, is it not written in your law, I said you are gods? If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, the scripture cannot be broken. Do you say of whom, whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said, I am the Son of God? This is one of those arguments that you, you get, it's, not something we do in English very often, but that you find in the Bible, you find in the first century, uh, it's a kind of lesser to greater argument. Jesus is basically saying, look, in the Old Testament, you get examples where the, the language of gods is used about those who receive God's word, whether that's the people together or whether that's particular people. That in some sense, because God's word is amongst them, because they are acting as agents of God, because they are uh, working for God, that word gods can be used for them. It's strange language, isn't it? It's unusual. Psalm 82. It doesn't happen very often, but it's there in the Old Testament. So Jesus is saying, look, if that's something that the Scriptures can do uh, when it speaks of God's messengers, how much more is it reasonable to use the word God to talk of the one whom the Father has consecrated and sent into the world? We're reminded of John 3, 16, aren't we? For God so loved the world that he sent his only son. This is who Jesus is. So talking of himself as God, talking of Jesus as the son of God, is completely reasonable. It's completely consistent uh, with what's been going on in the scriptures. Here is Jesus Christ giving a very uh, subtle Old Testament argument to people who were interested in subtle Old Testament arguments. It's an accommodation to them in a way, isn't it? It's another way of trying to help them see who Jesus is, that they might respond to him. What the Jews failed to grasp and what we need to grasp is this. Jesus doesn't make himself God. He makes himself man. And he's gracious, isn't he? Look at verse 37. If I am not doing the works of my Father, then do not believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works, 
that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. Again, even in the midst of rejection, in the midst of uh, continued opposition to who he is, Jesus is gracious and continues to offer salvation, continues to call people to see what's in front of them. See the works that I have done. What do they tell you about who I am? What do they tell you about God? And therefore respond to what is before your eyes. Again, it's another way of saying, as we saw back in verse 30, I and the Father are one. What Jesus does and what the Father does is the same. They are in each other. God doesn't do anything without Jesus being involved and vice further, vice versa. They have uh, what we sometimes call mutual coherence, if that helps. Uh, they are in one another. They are perfectly at work together. There is no sense here that Father and Son, or that Father, Son and Spirit, are working on separate projects, are doing something that is unbeknownst to the others, are acting against one another, are in competition, or any of those things. Here we are being given in John that picture of perfect harmony between Father and Son, and later, as we'll see in John's Gospel as well, between Father, Son, and Spirit. Now, we haven't got time this morning to tease out all the implications of that. I just want to tease out one, and it's this. Because Jesus is in the Father, what he says about the Father is true. Jesus' words about God can be trusted. We've talked about this before. We know that we live in a world where there is a crisis of knowing. That is, how do you really know something is true? Think about it. We live in a world where we are aware of fake news. And even if we don't think the news is fake, we are often quite rightly suspicious of what people tell us. We're presented with statistics, and you we yet yet we know that so very often the supposed statistics with which we're presented are heavily skewed. When someone stands up and tells us something, we're not sure whether it's true or not. We've talked about this as we've gone through John. We live in a world where there is a crisis of knowing. How can we really know that's true? We live in a world where people ask the question, can we really know from a book that this is what God said? Can God really communicate with us? Isn't this all just stuff that somebody came up with later? All those kind of questions are questions of knowing they're questions about trust. Now, there are some good and worthwhile questions there that we need to explore and that we need to take the time over. Absolutely there are. But at the heart of the answer to that question lies Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ has come from the Father, because Jesus Christ and the Father perfectly are one together, because Jesus is in the Father, what he says about the Father is true. When we come to the words of Jesus, and I think we can trust God's capacity to make sure that his words uh, continue to be accurately recorded. When we come to the words of Jesus, we know that we are hearing directly from God, and that is a word we can trust. And that's a word that we can build our lives on. And that's a word that we can have confidence in. And as this is Jesus saying to us, that he is the one who has come to us from the Father. And that he, as we've seen in John 7 to 10, he is the one who's come to us from the Father to live among us and to be lifted up for us, to die in our place, to die on the cross, the sheep, the, sorry, the shepherd who dies for the sheep, then we can have confidence that the way that we're right with God, that what it means to be religious if you're a Christian, is not to be striving always to earn God's favor, but to know that because Jesus Christ has come among us, lived for us, died for us, because the shepherd has died for the sheep, then we who follow him are his sheep who he holds in his hand, who he will never let go, and that we can build our lives individually and together. We can build our church on that foundation. Not that we're gathered here always to try and be a little bit better so that we might earn God's favor. 
so that we gather here to rejoice in the fact that Jesus Christ has done for us and we are his sheep, frail, weak, hurting, joyous. Whatever we are, but the ones who is gathered together in this place to praise and worship and live before him. And we can know that. Not as something ethereal, not as something merely subjective, not as something which doesn't belong in the categories of true knowledge, but at the heart of our lives and our existence because this is God's words come to us in Jesus Christ. Come to Jesus, the Son of God, who comes from the Father. Let me bring you back down to earth with verse 39. Again they sought to arrest him, but he escaped from their hands. There is a continual tragedy in the response of those John calls the Jews in these chapters. Again and again and again, they are presented with the very words of life. And again and again, they seek to arrest him, they seek to get rid of him, they seek to stop him. There is a tragedy here and there is a warning here, isn't there? Here is the end of Jesus' public ministry in John's Gospel. After this, it's stuff that happens in private on the whole. How does it end? It ends on one hand with unbelief. And there is a continual warning in John, isn't there, not to follow their lead. Instead, verse 40, he went again across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing at first, and there he remained. Verse 41, and many came to him and they said, John did no sign, but everything that John said about this man was true, and many believed in him there. It's not accidental that John records a return over the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing. It's as if John has sown the seed at which Jesus reaps, and many believed in him. That negative response to Jesus is not universal. There are those who trust in him in the first century. There are those who continue to trust in him today, who follow Jesus Christ, who are Christians because we trust Christ. Not because we think we're better than anybody else. We're usually conscious of the ways in which we're not terribly good. That's one of the things that brings us to Christ, isn't it? Not because we think we're better than anyone else, but because we trust in the shepherd who died for his sheep. And many believed in him there. As we understand who Jesus is from God's word, as we recognize that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, as we see what he's done and what he said, the call is to respond to him, to hear his word, to draw closer to the Lord Jesus Christ, whether we're drawing close to him for the first time or whether we need to remind ourselves again that yes, this is true, that this is who Jesus is, and yes, we can build our life here, and yes, this is the sure foundation when everything else is collapsing around us. The shepherd knows his sheep. Draw near to the shepherd. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you uh, for speaking to us through it and we pray that we would know your presence with us through your son, Jesus Christ. Help us to trust in him and his word. Draw us to yourself as individuals and together. Amen. King of love, my shepherd is, his goodness faileth never. Let's stand and sing together.
Please do sit down. If you join us at the end of the service, refreshments, tea and coffee will be served uh, over there. Trays will come around as well, so you can uh, wait for that if you wish. Uh, do take advantage of the opportunity to pray with uh, brothers and sisters uh, through in the Bradshaw area at the end of the service uh, and as we close the blessing. Christ the Good Shepherd, who laid down his life for the sheep, draw you and all who hear his voice to be one flock within one fold. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always.